Hello everyone, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video where we'll be talking about the amount of oxygen required for the Apollo missions. Now, I've had quite a few people bring this up recently, especially since the video I did about the amount of fuel needed to get to the moon. I've had some people arguing that they wouldn't have had enough oxygen on board, so the landings must have been faked, and other people asking me to debunk those claims. Granted, I have quite a few highly requested topics at the moment that I am slowly working through, but for today we're going to be covering this claim, that the Apollo astronauts would not have had sufficient oxygen for a mission to the moon and back. One person, for example, arguing that to support three astronauts for Apollo 11 would have required over 500 scuba tanks. Which is not the case, and in this video we'll aim to learn why they would not have required that much fresh air. Speaking of which, if your learning needs a breath of fresh air, then you should check out Brilliant.org, who are sponsoring this video. Learn new things or touch up on your existing knowledge with hundreds of classes on maths, science, and computing. I personally love Brilliant's interactive animations, which I find makes understanding things much easier. They guide you through learning the new topics and quiz you as you go to see how you're doing. And every question has its own explanation. So even if you get a question wrong, you can learn and understand why. I'm enjoying Brilliant so much that at the time of me filming, I'm on a streak of 283 continuous days of answering questions. So why not see if you'd enjoy it as much as I am by taking a 30-day free trial by visiting brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and the first 200 of you to do so can get 20% off an annual subscription. So firstly, where are they getting this 500 scuba tanks figure from? From what I can tell, this appears to be based on the fact that the average scuba tank duration is stated to be about 60 minutes. So for three astronauts, that's three tanks per hour, so 72 tanks per day, and Apollo 11 lasted just over eight days, which would be about 580 scuba tanks. So people argue that the landings must have been faked because you couldn't fit that many scuba tanks in the command service module. However, comparing scuba tanks to spacecraft oxygen supplies is apples to oranges. For starters, scuba divers don't use oxygen tanks. They carry compressed air tanks. They're not breathing pure oxygen. They're breathing the same air which we're breathing right now, with about 78% of it being nitrogen and only 21% of it being the oxygen that we actually need to stay alive. By comparison, Apollo had a pure oxygen atmosphere, so their tanks only carried 100% pure oxygen rather than the 20% oxygen and mostly nitrogen that scuba tanks use. So that right off the bat is five times more oxygen compared to scuba tanks. Secondly, when it comes to how long scuba tanks last, there are multiple variables, like the diver themselves. Someone with bigger lungs will take more air in with each breath. You have higher breathing rates due to activity levels, which will consume more air. Obviously, there's the size of the tank. Larger tanks will hold more air. But then also, there is the depth that you're diving has a huge impact on duration. Scuba tanks come in a range of capacities between 4 to 20 litres, average being about 12 litres. But on average, humans breathe about 8 litres of air per minute, meaning at sea level pressure, a 12-litre scuba tank would barely last 90 seconds. That's ignoring the fact that you would physically have to be sucking the air out of the tank. But by compressing the air into the tank, a much larger amount of air molecules can be carried within the same volume to allow the tank to last much longer. Scuba tanks are normally pressurized to around 3,000 psi, which is about 200 times the pressure of air at sea level. This allows a 12-litre tank to carry about 80 cubic feet worth of atmospheric air, which is equal to about 2,200 litres worth of air at sea level. Obviously, we can't just open a scuba tank valve at 3,000 psi and breathe that straight in. Our lungs would explode. So tanks use a regulator to reduce the pressure of air that we're breathing in, going through two stages. The first stage as it comes out of the tank partially reduces the pressure. And then the second stage is inside the mouthpiece. Now, the mouthpiece has water pressure pushing against it, so the air that's coming in has to push against that water pressure to move the diaphragm out of the way so that it can get into our mouth. The higher the pressure of water, then the more air will have to push against it to move the diaphragm out of the way so the air can get into the mouthpiece. 
Thus, deeper dive depths where there is more pressure will mean more air is consumed with each breath, because each 10 meters of depth increases the water pressure by one atmosphere, meaning scuba divers are breathing air equal to the pressure surrounding them. Now, the 60 minute duration that is given is based on a 12 liter tank diving at 10 meters, which means the divers in that example are breathing air at two atmosphere. Apollo's pure oxygen environment was pressured to only 5 psi, which is the equivalent of the air pressure on Earth at about 30,000 feet up. Now, we can't breathe unaided at 30,000 feet because that 5 psi of air pressure is only 20% oxygen, but obviously in a pure oxygen environment, that 5 psi is all oxygen, meaning the craft actually has a similar amount of oxygen per unit volume that we have here on Earth at sea level and thus astronauts could breathe absolutely fine, but without the need to carry around a load of nitrogen for absolutely no reason. Then there's also the state that the oxygen is stored. In scuba tanks, it's compressed gas, and the tank is just the ambient temperature, so about 20 degrees C, 68 Fahrenheit-ish. The Apollo tanks carried liquid oxygen, which was held at temperatures well below zero, now, as liquids are more dense than air, the same volume of storage is able to hold many more oxygen molecules when they're in liquid form than when they are a gas. When we look at the figures by weight, it becomes a lot clearer. The Apollo oxygen tanks could carry 320 pounds of liquid oxygen each. Now, up to Apollo 13, the service module carried two of these oxygen tanks for a total of 640 pounds of liquid oxygen. After the oxygen tank explosion on Apollo 13 that crippled it, the subsequent missions then carried a third separate tank in a different part of the service module to act as a backup, but up to that point we can go with 640 pounds of liquid oxygen. Now the figure of over 500 scuba tanks is based on an average human breathing on a 10 meter dive whilst using a 12 litre tank. That tank holds 80 cubic feet worth of air. 80 cubic feet worth of air at atmospheric pressure weighs about 6.46 pounds. But that 6.5 pounds of air is only 21% oxygen. Now, an oxygen molecule weighs slightly more than nitrogen, so if we go by weight, then 23% of air is oxygen. For simplicity, let's be generous and round it up to 25. So a 12 litre scuba tank would carry about 1.6 pounds worth of oxygen. So by my math, the Apollo oxygen tanks could carry the equivalent to roughly 400 scuba tanks worth of just oxygen. Right about now, some people might be thinking, hang on, if Apollo could only carry 400 scuba tanks worth of oxygen, and divers would need 580 scuba tanks to breathe for as long as Apollo did, then obviously it's all fake, right? Well, not quite. That 640 pound figure is based on the oxygen tanks in the service module alone. On Apollo 11, two of the astronauts spent pretty much a full day in the lunar module, which carried its own tanks that held almost 100 pounds of oxygen itself. So on an eight day mission, that's 192 hours, multiplied by three astronauts is 576 man hours, Minus two astronauts being away for 24 hours leaves 528 man hours in the command module. Now granted, that's still below the 400 scuba tank figure for the oxygen supply, and actually, a lot of the oxygen that was stored in the service module wasn't even used for crew breathing. The command module's power came from fuel cells, which used the supply of liquid hydrogen from a different tank, along with liquid oxygen. The reaction produced electricity to power the command module systems, as well as producing water as a byproduct for the crew to be able to drink. However, now we come to the biggest flaw in comparing scuba tanks to spacecraft. The air that we breathe in is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, almost 1% argon, and then traces of other gases like carbon dioxide. The air that we exhale is still 78% nitrogen, our bodies don't touch that, but exhaled air is still 17% oxygen and 4% carbon dioxide. So basically, 4% of the air that we breathe in is absorbed by our body in the form of oxygen, and is then replaced by the carbon dioxide that our bodies have produced from a previous breath's worth of oxygen. But crucially, of the oxygen within the air that we breathe in, only a fifth of it is actually used by our body. The remaining four fifths is exhaled straight back out into our surroundings. 
For a scuba diver, those surroundings are the water. Every exhaled breath by a scuba diver is pushed out of the regulator and into the water where it then floats to the surface. You can see the stream of bubbles coming from scuba divers. That is all exhaled air. So of an entire scuba tank's worth of air, only 21% of it is actually oxygen to begin with, and only one-fifth of that oxygen is actually used by the diver. The rest gets expelled out to work its way back into Earth's atmosphere. Whereas a spacecraft, by comparison, is an airtight vessel. So Apollo astronauts would breathe in pure oxygen and breathe out mostly oxygen that was unused, plus the carbon dioxide that their bodies had just produced, but the exhaled air would remain inside the spacecraft. So to keep three scuba divers alive underwater for eight days may require 580 scuba tanks, but about 95% of the air within those tanks will essentially be wasted. An arguably more appropriate comparison, rather than scuba divers, would instead be a submarine, because the exhaled air from sailors doesn't get dumped overboard. The biggest problem Apollo faced wasn't about having enough oxygen, it was what to do with the carbon dioxide that's exhaled that has nowhere to go. This is where Apollo used lithium hydroxide canisters as air scrubbers because they absorb carbon dioxide and thus allow the astronauts to rebreathe the oxygen that they've previously exhaled without the risk of dying from carbon dioxide poisoning. In fact, air scrubbers kind of brings us back to scuba divers because the crazy amounts of wasted air within an open circuit scuba diving setup led to the development of CCRs or closed circuit rebreathers the basic principle of these seems to be that they carry two small tanks, one air and one oxygen. The diver breathes from the air tank, but the exhaled air is not dumped into the surrounding water, it's instead circulated back around through an air scrubber which absorbs the carbon dioxide and so saves the oxygen that would have otherwise been wasted, and the oxygen that was taken in by the diver is replenished from the oxygen tank. This allows the divers to remain submerged for much longer. General figures seem to suggest up to about four hours with just a three litre oxygen cylinder. Although there are mentions that this could in theory go up to 10 hours. But let's stick with four hours for a three litre cylinder. Now, as the original claim was 580 tanks based on a 12 litre cylinder, each one lasting one hour, if a three litre rebreather can last four hours, then a 12 litre oxygen tank with a rebreather should in theory last about 16 hours. So to support three divers for eight days would only need 36 tanks in total, a long way off 580 and well within the capacity to fit inside the Apollo service module. And whilst we're on the topic of Apollo and oxygen, we might as well cover the lunar module while we're at it because I've seen people question this one too. As mentioned earlier, the Apollo 11 lunar module carried a total of about 100 pounds of oxygen. Now, this was not only used for breathing in the cabin, but also for filling their EVA packs as well. Now, I've seen people question, how did they have enough oxygen since they had to open the door to go outside? And it's true, the lunar module didn't have any system for restoring the oxygen that was in the cabin. They simply vented it off into space and then the cabin was repressurized with fresh oxygen after they got back. The reason being is that the amount of oxygen actually lost wasn't that much, and so a system to keep hold of that oxygen within the cabin would have probably needed more weight than the oxygen that it would have saved. The total pressurized volume of the lunar module was 235 cubic feet. Based on atmospheric pressure, that volume would require 19 pounds of air but that's air at over 14 PSI. At 5 PSI of pure oxygen that the lunar module used, it's only about 6.5 pounds worth of gas lost. Apollo 11 only did one depressurized, repressurized cycle of the lunar module because they only did one EVA, and their time outside was about 2.5 hours because they were airing on the side of caution. They weren't sure how much oxygen they'd use because they'd never done a walk on the moon before. Obviously, their EVA suits worked more like the rebreather scuba setups, where their exhaled air was recirculated and cleaned, so a relatively small oxygen tank would have lasted several hours. In fact, Apollos 12 and 14 both did two EVAs, with them reaching nearly five hours per EVA, and Apollo 15 onwards each had three EVAs, with the longest single EVA hitting almost seven and a half hours. 
although those missions did carry extra oxygen supplies to facilitate them. So hopefully that has cleared up any misconceptions for people. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.